evening and welcome to the Baldwin Public Library Board meeting of September 15th, 2014. The first thing we'll do is to have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next thing we need to do is establish a quorum. Uh, Mr. Terra. I'm here. Mr. Suhey. Here. Mr. Pisano. Here. Ms. Bryce. Here. Mr. Underdown. Here. Mr. Kellett. Here. Absent and excused are Mr. Harris and Ms. Maelstrom. Thank you very much. The next item is the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion and approved by a roll call vote. There will be no discussion of these items unless a board member or a citizen so requests, in which case the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered as the last item of new business. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So I move a oh. approval of the consent agenda for September 15th. Second. Seconded by Jim. Very good. Next we have the... No, we need a roll call vote on the... Yes. He's, help, he's helping me out here, and that's good. Okay? Uh, Mr. Terra. Yes. Mr. Suhey. Yes. Mr. Pisano. Yes. Ms. Bryce. Yes. Mr. Underdown. Yes. Absent and excused, Mr. Harris. I did say roll call vote when I read that, didn't I? <laughs> the next uh, item are board reports. Uh, no president's report tonight. Um, do we have board comments? Oh, no. We have to do. No, that's right. Yeah. Do we have any board comments? Surprisingly, none. OK. Then we have item C, which is the introduction of new staff. Alicia. Good evening. Uh, my name is Alicia Bell. I want to uh, give a thank you to Connie Ilmore and Doug Kosich. Those were, of course, the director and head of adult services who hired me as a permanent part-time adult services librarian here at Baldwin Public Library. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to work within this community. As way of background information on myself, I have a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's degree in counseling and also my master's degree in library and information science. Um, which I received in December 2013. For the past two years, I worked as a library um, intern at Southfield Public Library. Before that, I was a volunteer with friends for over five years at Southfield Public Library and also a library aide there at Southfield Public Library. So that's a little bit about my history and I just wanna say that I'm glad to be here and part of this wonderful staff, thank you. Hey. Thank you Good. very Welcome. much, Alicia. <laughs> Thank you very much and very well spoken. <laughs> Are you leaving already? <laughs> yes. Gotta go back on duty. Very oh. good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a, a presentation by Sue LaBelle on the magnifying collection. here in the adult services department have been for quite a while um, most of you are familiar with the books and bites fundraiser that was held here last year and that was uh, intended to benefit library users who have special needs of various types um, I was appointed to be on the committee that was selecting items that would be useful for people who need special needs and I, I think maybe because I have been buying large print books for the library for quite some time that's one of the reasons that I was asked to do this and the 
committee decided to purchase a collection of magnifying glasses of different types to help people who have low vision but who are still wanting to be able to read things. And so what I did is I brought a preview this evening. We have um, eight kinds of traditional magnifiers. We have three each of those. And then we have three um, electronic um, video magnifiers that are a little bit um, fancier. And so what I brought you was a sample that you could try so you can see how they work. And I gave you, um, the board members, a copy of Books and Beyond because I thought that little box of print that's underneath the picture of Temple Grandin is a nice thing to um, right. try it out on. By the way, they're going to circulate in these plastic bags, and they have a list that says what's in each bag and all of that. So this is the first one. This is like a traditional magnifier, but it has no rim, and it has a light. And um, if you want to pass these around and try them out, you'll see it's a nice shape for um, when you're looking at a column and something, maybe a telephone book or something of that type. Um, this one. And they all have their own case and all of this that they have around it. This is, um, this is lighted also. This is uh, it's called a stand magnifier. You can take this handle off, but basically you set this right on. Let's say you want to look at something and you want to set that right there if you want to look at it. And we'll see what happens when you do that. Adjust it a little bit. That's good, though. Isn't yeah, it? it is. And then really the most like exciting it. item here. Most exciting. Item. This is exciting. Is this one? I don't know if I should let you have this, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Probably shouldn't. <laughs> now this is electronic, where the green thing is where you turn it on. When you turn it on, um, oh lights up there. And then this is the battery indicator. See, I charged it up. That goes away in a minute. And you can use this like a handheld thing up and down over there. Or I'll give it back to you in one second. Or you can, if you do that, you can set it oh right down. God. And this changes the size of the um, print. You can take a picture of what it is like that, kind of say you need to carry this away and look at something, you know, you can do that. So it's really quite, it's fun. And I think it will be helpful for people who sure. have problems with vision. Um, they can use these in the library, or they can check them out and take them home. Um, they're going to live in that glass case that's by the adult uh, services desk right now. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a glass display case there. And that's where there'll be an example of each one of these living in the case. When oh. you, when you. Sorry. <laughs> what? Uh, questions? When you take a, a picture, can you put, uh, forward that to your phone? I don't think so. No, okay. I don't, not with this. I do not believe no. that you can do that. No, oh, it's just, just kind of, just takes it to maybe you want to oh. take a, a view of something and walk away from where it is and still be able to read it. Um, hmm. How did you go about determining which devices to purchase? Oh, yeah, they did. Um, we decided to talk to uh, the person who is at the, a store that specializes in these devices. The name of the store is AbleZone, and it's in Troy over on Rochester Road. And she um, was very helpful. She brought us a selection of a lot of different kinds of things that they had. Um, and I looked at them. Catherine looked at them. We kind of <coughs> looked and see, and then we asked for recommendations about what she thought, because she knew more about it than we did, um, what things would be useful that people might like to, to use or to try out. That, yeah. And then Susan, what will be the limitations on checkout? Let's say uh, a patron wants to check out, is it for a week or two weeks or? I can we haven't determined that? The agreement so far, oh. I think, is that it would be like a a book. You could take okay. it for three weeks because maybe you want to use it with a book for three weeks. I don't know if all the details are 100% finalized, but 
that was what we discussed. Is that right, Catherine? The only, um, the only exception to that is the electronic magnifiers will only go up for one week. But all of the um, just kind of regular traditional magnifiers will go up for three weeks. Give us a general idea of the kind of cost that we're looking at with these items. Well, there's quite a range of costs. The very simple thing is um, 20 or 30 dollars. The electronic ones, as you might imagine, are a lot more expensive. I think the range was between, for the list price, between 400 dollars and 900 somewhere like that we did get a discount because we're a library from the okay. from the able zone store that um, sold us these okay. items thank you mm -hmm. wasn't that fun yeah that's fun <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> thank you how, how are you going to let people know about them that's something I'm well, we, we started um, here in our special needs article. Um, we are also planning on sending out a press release to um, local papers. And as Jim pointed out at the last meeting, the um, glass case that we're intending to use, which is currently housing the art um, that Connie uh, so generously has loaned to the adult services side of the building, um, is very visible. We think that that's probably going to be our number one way of showing people. It's right next to the adult services desk. It's right by the Hot Picks DVDs. Um, in addition, we have part of the money from the last Books and Bites fundraiser went to fund a brochure um, pointing out all of the new special needs services, and those should be coming later this week. I'm, I'm guessing that librarians also know people that need them and will be able to suggest them to Yes, absolutely. We could also, of course, uh, do some outreach to the Lions Clubs in the area. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Bob? Yeah, do do we know if the Rochester Hills uh, Library for Visually Impaired, that sub-regional, um, which isn't a sub-regional, if they have a sim similar items for circulation? Uh, I don't believe that the particular sub-regional does, but I do believe that the library does, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, okay, the the yes. Rochester Hills Library right. does, as does the Plymouth Public Library. Um, but we have also been working with that sub-regional library. Um, a, a while back, they gave us um, access to some of the materials to do demonstrations for people who are blind, who use, for example, the BARD system, which is um, blind access to downloadable um, audiobooks. Mm -hmm. And then they have a specific player that they use. So either they can mail you a book or you can download it offline, depending on what you're comfortable with. And we have access to that player, and we now also have access to the online system as well, okay. which our librarians will be trained on so that they can also promote that to people with low vision. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Th uh, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. I'm sad to see we're not having books and bites again this year, but uh, definitely it, we're raising funds for, to, for a good cause that provides a great service to our residents and our contract community. So thanks again for doing all this. Okay. So, uh, Sheila? And when I last took a tour of the Clinton McComb Library, I was just uh, overwhelmed or amazed at the collection they had for low vision. Came back and, and thought, oh dear, we don't have this. And now the turnaround time has been terrific. So. Uh, for all those who attended Books and Bites and the sponsors and supporters, uh, these are really valued tools and resources. And things that we want to be able to do to take it out of our fund balance and to right. give to our residents and our contract yeah. community. All right. Any other comments? Thank you very much. Uh, the next item are board committee reports, and the first committee report is uh, Frank with the Finance Committee. Yes, on Tuesday, September 9th, uh, Doug Koshik, Catherine Bergeron, Jim Suhey, and myself met upstairs at the, in the boardroom. In attendance was Ron Carpenter, who is our financial consultant at Raymond James. He went over our endowment funds and our general uh, funds to tell us what our performance was year to date. Uh, we're currently up 5.5%, lagging uh, the S&P modestly, but we have a diversified portfolio, 70% allocated to equities or stocks and a 30% allocation to fixed income. He did recommend that uh, if we did see some sort of correction uh, in the next few months, 
that uh, if our equity position did fall below the 70% line, that w would be wise or prudent on our part is to maybe sell out of our fixed income and add to equities because eventually when the interest rates do rise, that's going to put a drag on our portfolio returns going forward uh, because we'll see a negative return uh, in bonds and we think that stocks are uh, really where uh, you'd want to be um, if, we, if uh, the market continues to move upward. Uh, our trust policy says that we cannot have more than 75% in equities at one time. So we would definitely would want to watch that if we did uh, dip down to, you know, and added to equities and they did continue to move up F in the future, we might have to be, excuse me, forced to reduce our equity position and buy fixed income w for what our policy says. So I thought it was a very good meeting uh, and uh, he's doing a great job. He did talk about the general funds account, which we do have some money sitting there that was do uh, uh, people donated to the library that was unspecified. And over the last year, we decided to be very conservative with that money because we didn't know what would happen with the library building. And we thought that we could have some naming rights or, or whatnot. But now that uh, that's been put on the back burner right now, we've decided to be a little bit more aggressive uh, with that money and go into what's called balance funds. And we will be moving uh, a portion of our, our uh, fixed income, which is the Lord Abbott short uh, term income fund into the Lord Abbott balance fund, which is a 60 40 split to give us a little bit better return and also protect us if when interest rates do rise that we we are keeping up and, and showing good returns. Um, Doug also went over the final year 2013 2014 uh, uh, final year, it did look like um, we were up, uh, we had a surplus of $214,800, which was fantastic on Doug's part with, with the budget. And that's brought our, our fund balance up to $1,377,251. So continue to do, he's continued to do a great job at managing the business. I did mention that uh, we might want to uh, spend a little bit more of that money in other areas next year and, and also maybe uh, look at maybe giving our, our employees a, a raise, very similar to what the city uh, of Birmingham has done, possibly 2%, so I hope that uh, we, can, we can achieve that. Uh, the budget for fiscal 2014-2015 is tracking very well after the last two, uh, for the last two months. Uh, Doug did present uh, a report on, from Jim Suhave that he would like to see a, a five-year uh, trend of our, our fiscal years, and, and it was very helpful to show us where, we've, where we started and where we are today, and it showed significant improvement. Um, and, and really, what is a great benefit was it being able to add uh, Bloomfield Hills as a contract community to help balance our budget. Uh, Doug did uh, present some information gathered from what other libraries fund balance might be, what Plant Moran would recommend, what a fund balance uh, allocation might be. Currently we're at 42% of our operating expense. Is that the right amount? Or now that we feel a little bit more comfortable uh, with our contract communities, uh, with Bloomfield Hills going in for uh, six years, uh, with uh, being a partner with us, and also with uh, Beverly Hills, uh, raising their millage a couple of years ago that we really have solid partners that maybe we might be able to reduce that fund balance down a little bit to be able to provide uh, more options for the library rather than raising our millage um, and going to the city for uh, more taxpayer money where we can accomplish a couple of things uh, with the money that we currently have. Uh, an RFP uh, is being sent out for the three technology projects we've been talking about and we'll be bringing that to, uh, to your attention when we finally get those bids. Uh, Catherine did go over the Friends of, uh, of the Library expenditures, and we always thank them for their gracious uh, uh, contribution to be able to provide all our programming. Uh, I also um, attended on September 3rd the Investment Committee at the City of Birmingham. Uh, at that time, Steve uh, Gasper at UBS went over uh, what the plan is, is how the the, fun, uh, the the retirement plan is doing. They're currently up around 5% year to date. Uh, he did say, pardon me, uh, investment outlook continued uh, above average volatility in both equity and fixed income markets. Uh, he thinks that the fixed income outlook over the next two or three years, considering uh, we're going to see uh, lower that lower long-term historic returns in that asset class, and that's why we think equities are, are more advantageous at this time. Uh, equity outlook, while positive, expect to be volatile and somewhat uh, below long-term historic returns because of the great returns we've seen over the last few years since the, the great uh, recession of 2008. Uh, third quarter results uh, expect uh, volatility with gains in both equities and fixed incomes. 
And he uh, did say that uh, changes going forward in the investment policy was reduce equities from an overweight position and maybe add to their alternative strategies, which we currently have 13% uh, allocated in that fund. He might want to raise that another 2% just to reduce the volatility in the portfolio. We did have two manager updates, uh, Systematic uh, Fund and 300 North Capital. Those are the mid-cap managers. One's a value manager and one's a growth manager. So they're tracking very well. I think, uh, you know, Steve Gasper and his group are doing a great job. And the investment committee is very collaborative, very uh, engaging to make sure that we're on the right track for our retirees. Uh, the next meeting, um, we are going to review uh, an asset strategy alternative. Uh, part of our alternative assets is called Abbey Capital, which they're going to come in and talk to us. And also, we're going to start exploring uh, maybe using in our large cap space where we have uh, active money managers that have been underperforming the, their benchmark over the last year, a couple of years. And it's a very difficult space to try to beat the S&P 500. So they might be looking at adding ETFs, which would lower the cost uh, of to the plan and, 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 and balance it out a little bit. So I, I, I look forward to going, uh, coming, going to that meeting, coming back and hearing what they have to say and what changes they've made. I did attend uh, the retirement board meeting on Friday, uh, September 12th, went over the same thing. So it, I thought it was a, a very good meeting and uh, very engage, engaging. Um, and then Doug did mention uh, that uh, Baldwin's telephone equipment uh, is, is outdated. The city's going with uh, IP type of phones, and he thought, thought it would be beneficial for us to upgrade our phone system. Now, it's not part of our budget this year, but he thinks that we could put it in and we'll be fine. It's about $20,000, but he, he felt that it's, it's necessary for us to be compatible with the city's telephone system and keep uh, Baldwin's telephone equipment from becoming obsolete. So continue to do a great job. Uh, the next finance committee meeting is Monday, October 13th at 4.30. We always invite the public to come and, and hear what we have to say and even add um, some input if, if they see deemed necessary. So did I miss anything, Jim? Or? No, no, that's okay. great. Okay. Great. Okay. Anybody have any comments? I do. Um, I, I want to say that these things that Frank are talking about um, are things that have been discussed at finance committee meetings previously and that they are not um, they're not reflecting decisions or recommendations by the finance committee but only Frank's personal opinion and I just want to be on record as saying that the um, changes in the fund balance ratios use of fund balance uh, amounts for particular uh, uses that we have not traditionally used fund balance money for, uh, and even a uh, uh, talking about a pay raise somewhere down the road of a specific amount are all worthy subjects for discussion and debate, but none of them are decisions that have been made. I just want to be very clear about that. Did, you, did I say that they were? Sorry, uh, no, did, they, did no. I say they were made, or we just talked no. about it there? No, but you're... Yeah, okay. But, I just, yeah. but it's, you know, they're, just pretty, to they're, pretty major, they're pretty major items that you're discussing. And w without clarification, a casual listener might think that we're, these are actually decisions that have been made. I, on the pay raise, the city uh, got a pay... City employees got a pay raise last year. It w our employees did not. And I thought that it would be something if we were able to achieve that. You know, we're only two months into this year. That wouldn't be effective until July of next year. Though I would like to see, hopefully, we could do that for our employees. All right. Anyone else have any comments? Seeing none, we'll go to the uh, building committee with uh, Jim, Suhey, and Doug. Well, we didn't have a building committee. Uh, um, in between board meetings. So Doug is going to bring us up to date on some uh, uh, outstanding issues here, and then we'll talk about the next uh, steps for the library program, building program. We have uh, received news from uh, the city manager concerning the library's freight elevator. Um, the city has determined that many uh, parts of the freight elevator will need to be replaced. Next Monday, September 22nd, the City Commission will um, decide whether to 
pay for the specifications on the work that needs to be done. I expect that they will approve that. And uh, from that point on, it will take 17 to 25 weeks for the work to be done. So we can expect to have a fully functional freight elevator again somewhere between late January and late March of next year. Uh, it does mean that the work will not be done by the time of the uh, annual book sale, Friends of the Library book sale in November, and we are exploring our options how to get um, the remaining books out of the basement and into the hands of whoever it is who is going to be taking those books away. We are talking about roughly 300 boxes at that time. But Doug, the freight elevator is functional now. We just yes. don't know if it'll be functional tomorrow. That yeah, basically that's it? basically it, and we uh, want to make sure that we don't strain it so that it ceases functioning altogether. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, there will be a report about the possibility of an external book drop. I'd like to welcome everybody who is here today to hear the discussion about the external book drop and also about the future of the library building. And uh, B.J. Blackford, uh, especially, I'm glad to have you here for your contribution to this. Um, I will reduce the lights. A staff committee was put together to look at the uh, possibility of uh, setting up an external book drop around the library building. The library board had previously indicated that we should explore options on the library block, uh, not remotely. And um, when we conducted this investigation, we um, were thinking that because we have two-way streets around the library, the uh, book drop itself would actually be on the passenger side as opposed to the um, driver's side. So we looked at several options and uh, in the board packet are the pros and cons of the four options we looked at. Um, the map shows the different options. And uh, Catherine, can you help me with the yellow light here. And if we don't have it, we don't have it. Okay. <laughs> I shall have to step away occasionally then. The four options we looked at are on Bates So first, I'm going to look at the um, Bait Street option. The Bait Street option um, is the one that actually of the four were, uh, was the one recommended by staff. Uh, that is because it is at the end of the ramp that leads down from the entrance to the library. If we put an external book drop uh, out there for people to use, the, we have to have a way to get the materials into the library. So positioning the book drop closest to the ramp that leads to the main entrance is advisable. The staff committee also met with uh, Mark Clemens, the assistant uh, police chief, and uh, he looked at the four options from the standpoint of uh, traffic flow and traffic safety. He thought that that position was, al was also the best uh, because it would involve the elimination of only one parking spot. Uh, also, at that side of the library, we have Bait Street, which is wider than uh, at least um, 
Merrill Street, and uh, cars queuing up to get into the book drop, if they do actually queue up, would not be blocking any intersection. The second uh, option we looked at was on Merrill Street on the south uh, east corner of the library. Um, that is closer to the, uh, to the ramp leading to the front door than some of the other options. And for that reason, from a staff standpoint, it would be the second best uh, possibility. Uh, there were some issues that Mark Clements pointed out. Um, for example, uh, two parking spaces would need to be eliminated there. Also, if any cars queue up to get into the glide path, they could possibly block the intersection of Merrill and Bates. Also, Merrill Street is relatively narrow. It is narrower than, um, than Bates. The third option on the west side of the library is Chester Street. Uh, it is the furthest from the ramp and therefore from a staff standpoint the least desirable. Uh, it would involve the elim elimination of two parking spaces. It has some of the same limitations, Mark pointed out, as the um, location on Merrill Street. I do want to point out there is one advantage of uh, having it on Chester Street over any of the other three locations, and that is Chester Street is always open. The other three streets are occasionally closed because of activities in downtown Birmingham. The fourth option is on uh, Martin Street, north of the library. It would involve uh, angle parking. And uh, at first, when we talked about it, it seemed like a good option. The cars could just pull in and pull out again, back, you know, back out from the position. Uh, we could have actually a drop box on the driver's side. Uh, the more we looked at it, however, the uh, geometry of it just didn't work out. Uh, it would involve quite a bit more work than the others in order to get the drop box in the proper location. Um, it is also further away from the ramp than either the Bates Street or Merrill Street options. So in summary, uh, we looked at four options on each of the streets surrounding the library. The one that we thought presented the most opportunity um, was the uh, location on Bates Street close to Merrill. Since then, uh, I have had a conversation with uh, Camille Jane, uh, Executive Director of the Community House. Uh, one option that we certainly had thought of over the, um, and I am not sure why this keeps moving, even with nobody touching it. Uh, uh, one um, option we had not seriously considered uh, was turning Merrill into a one-way street. We simply thought that there would be too much opposition to it. Uh, we have found out that the community house would not be opposed to turning Merrill into an eastbound one-way street, which would allow cars to come up from the west uh, into the same location that we uh, were thinking of anyway on Merrill Street. But in this case, um, cars queuing up would not um, be blocking an intersection, and the drop box would actually be on the driver's side. So I personally think that this is an option we might wish to explore uh, further. We have not done so. When uh, Mark Clements, the assistant police chief, was here, we did not go over that, um, that particular arrangement in terms of traffic flow and safety. Now, the box itself comes in several different sizes and the one that staff is currently recommending is the largest one, which would allow us to um, empty it the least number of times during holiday seasons, um, during holiday closures. And I believe the library is closed about 12 days a year. This book drop would fit well in any of the locations except on Chester. Chester has a very uh, narrow space between the curb and the sidewalk. Uh, it would hold up to 
1,100 books or 2,700 DVDs, or if you use one Dropbox for each of those, this is actually a double Dropbox, it would be 550 books and 1,350 DVDs. The cost of a box like this is uh, a little bit over $10,000. The box does come in the colors shown here on the uh, sheet that the library board members have received. Uh, that cost does include carts that would be used to transport the items uh, to and from the, um, the library entrance. Uh, somebody has suggested an automate, that we use automated carts. Uh, it would help staff, especially in inclement weather. Um, at one time in the past, we did have an external book drop and we have heard from the uh, director of the library at that time that there um, actually was a uh, workers' compensation uh, suit filed at that time, and we would try to avoid anything like that. So the uh, automated uh, book cart would be ideal. However, they are quite expensive. It is approximately $5,000 per cart, which would bring the total cost to over $20,000. So I've uh, presented the information. I would uh, be uh, happy to hear any comments from uh, the library board members and then eventually from the public. And uh, we would like some sense of direction, whether we should continue and in what direction we should be going. Hey, Doug, um, it's not clear to me um, how many book compartments or trays are in this large box. Is there just one or are there two separate there, there are compartments two that need to be emptied? Uh, there are two separate compartments. All right, would you need, is that why you need two carts? Yes. Two, two electric carts, okay. I had a question. Um, would the five minute parking spaces uh, on Merrill be eliminated? Uh, Yes, uh, we were thinking of that. There are currently two five-minute parking spaces uh, so that people could run in and um, deposit books, pick something up quickly. Um, by the way, one member of the public has suggested that if we don't want to go this route and spend uh, the amount of money for an external book drop, we could actually uh, change the, um, uh, the wording uh, on those parking spaces and uh, specify that they are only for uh, drop-off and, and people are only supposed to get out and go to the drop box and then come back again. So it would really be only a one or two minute uh, parking spot instead of five minutes. But if we go ahead with this, the uh, idea is that uh, in s this would replace the five minute parking spaces. So for example, if we put it on Merrill Street, roughly where the two five-minute spa uh, spaces are located now, um, it would just eliminate those two spaces. If we have it on um, Bate Street, however, then perhaps we could um, uh, change those five-minute uh, spots to metered spots for 15 or 30 minutes. We are certainly concerned about the number of parking spaces in the city. We know that the city commission is concerned about that also. So we're trying to uh, reduce or eliminate um, the loss of any parking spaces. Doug, the city would be, um, of course, would want the one parking space we're using on uh, Bates uh, replaced by taking one, away, away one of the five-minute parking spaces, but I wouldn't rush to give up the other five-minute parking space. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, one for one seems seems what the city wants. Or we can turn the other five-minute parking space into two minutes, like you say. I'm really excited about it. Thank you so much for all your hard work and really uh, coming back so quickly to the board on this issue. Um, just one comment: If you know, this is a uh, we're 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 a service company. We want to service our residents and our contract communities, and this is something new that we've never ha we haven't had for years. So I would want maybe to put a sign out front if in, during those holiday times or or whatnot. If if the this is full, we would still want 
our patrons to go up and maybe walk up the steps and drop off the books if we could. And, and it, this is a, a great service, um, but we still uh, would, you know, put a sign there. So if it is full, that we, you know, we are in a walkable community, but to walk up the steps and put the book into the 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 the, the slot. slot that we have already. But I think this is this is fantastic, and thank you so much for all your hard work and coming this fast to the board on, on these recommendations. Thank you. Yeah. Bob? Yeah, I, I think it's great also, uh, but, and I, I do have a question. Um, other libraries uh, have drop boxes of this sort and have had experience with this. In fact, we've had experience with the drop box back in the 70s or 80s, if I recall. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned about, um, Unfortunately, in every community, there are uh, people who are not so nice, and I'm concerned about inappropriate <coughs> things being deposited in the drop box, and particularly the effect on staff members who are required to empty the drop box. How does that work out in other places? Uh, we had some bad experiences back in the 1980s. Um, in talking to library directors, they have current library directors, they seem not to have uh, experienced as many issues as we might think. So uh, it's not as if it's uh, totally risk free, but uh, it seems to be uh, definitely worth the risk. There always is the possibility of something inappropriate getting put in there. Uh, the boxes are fire retardant, so at least that issue is taken care of. But I'm, I'm sorry to have to bring that up, but it's a very gratifying answer, so thank you. I wondered how the, um, and I'll be eager to hear any public who want to weigh in on this, but what our staff thought about um, pickup and um, their responsibilities or whoever would be responsible for going to the drop boxes or using an automated cart, um, was, was that discussed much in the committee? Uh, yes. Uh, we have not, um, I cannot say that staff has definitively said the automated cart is worth it. I would like to talk to a library that actually has used the cart first and right now I don't have any names, so we have to do further research. But the concept is good. Um, we are doing this for the public. We have heard that the public would like something along these lines, that it would be a service to them. Uh, what we are uh, planning to do would not get in the way of any future uh, development of the library building. Um, staff, as far as themselves are concerned, would rather not have it at all. I do want to make that very clear. It is a burden to have to go out several times a day to, uh, to get the materials from the Dropbox, but they realize that it is a service to the public. Uh, we are now advertising for a, uh, another part-time maintenance assistant who would be assisting us on weekends, perhaps on Monday evenings. Um, so we are hoping that if, if, if we have this additional staff, they would help uh, take care of some of the burden. Uh, Doug, I think it's fair to say just this, uh, the sense of the board is that you should continue on this and just drive ahead as quickly as you can. But uh, we also have to run down this option of uh, turning, turning Maryland to a one-way street going east. And knowing the uh, city and how it values its long-range planning, particularly for streets, um, that's going to be a difficult hurdle. So the faster you get to them and broach it, I think the faster we, we will get to a solution. I think, Martin, if that would happen, you know, have a one-way street, that would uh, solve a lot of our problems with the, the driver side drop-off. I think that's going to be a little bit longer term uh, to talk to them about, but um, I really what Duani said, and I'm so happy that uh, Camila Jane is, you know, would, on board with this to work in partnership with the community house 
uh, that this is a, a great working relationship to move forward, especially what Duwani said, eventually if something does happen uh, to the building and uh, where we're placed to the park, it's a, it's a great civic area. So I think this has a lot of potential. It doesn't mean uh, if we don't do the one-way street right now on Martin, we still could put it on Bates, and this could be very flexible, and we could move the box later on. Uh, it's Merrill. Oh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Merrill, yeah. I'm sorry, Merrill. Yeah. I, Merrill, I, I'm Merrill, I apologize. But I, I, th I think it's great to work with the community house and drive for a civic area because we have a, a great piece of property to expand on the, on the park, so. Right, my, my sense of the board is that uh, we think it's a project that should be pursued. Are you asking for specific direction from us tonight or simply encouragement to continue researching it? Um, I would say encouragement on um, uh, researching the exact box and the kind of cart that we would uh, purchase. Uh, can I get a sense from the board that um, of all of the four options that I presented at first, uh, do you agree that the Bates option is the best? Yes, I say so. Okay, Perfect. and then the other option we will look at is uh, Merrill being turned into a one-way street, and that way we could obtain a driver's side uh, box. Yes. I do want to um, mention to the public that uh, this is something the library would pay for either out of its current balance, uh, budget or out of its uh, fund balance or trust funds, but we would not be asking for an extra money for this. I do agree with what Frank said. We could have a short-term, long-term uh, perspective on turning Merrow into a one-way street. We can go, if it looks like it's going to take a while to get something like that to the city, we can proceed with the, uh, with the Bates Street box and work on this one-way concept. But, but I suspect that that's going to take a while. I, I do have one other question. Uh, does the box require uh, structural, foundational work? Um, what I'm really trying to get mm -hmm. at is how easy or difficult or costly it would be to move to move the box if the location we start with uh, is not the best. I don't have an exact cost, but no, it would not be uh, very expensive. Okay, good, great. I, I think we should move forward with this. Uh, the only comment I want to make is that um, I'm picturing uh, pushing 50 or 100 uh, pounds up that ramp and I'm thinking the electric would be much better because if there's any snow or water or anything like that, pushing, I'm pushing the cart around with that much weight in it up that ramp is not going to be easy. Yep. So Good. I don't know, uh, looking at what the um, experience that people have with those carts and the, you know, how if they don't, th hopefully they don't break down and all that sort of thing. They're good and sturdy and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Shall we hear from the public then? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, would you please step forward? And Catherine's going to bring the uh, microphone up. Go ahead and step up to the microphone, please. Thanks. Margaret Betts, wouldn't it be nice if every library card issued was a drop key? dot box key so that like at a motel if you want to open the lock box to put books in you just slide it in and out <laughs> great idea. I, I just think that would i don't think it can be done but i think it would be great mm -hmm. do you have a patent on it yet <laughs> <laughs> that would be good thank you thank you thank you anyone else go ahead step right up to the microphone please okay state your name please Okay, DB. Thank you. Uh, first, we would have to get uh, clearance from the uh, appropriate boards in the city. Um, uh, for example, the planning board, because something is actually be being done to the site. Um, uh, and, and then the traffic and safety board, I'm not sure if multimodal I have. Multimodal now. Multimodal, yeah. yes. Um, so it will take a while actually to get uh, approval. As a pr and then uh, once the approval has been obtained, we would have to order it. Uh, it would take a few weeks to come. 
Uh, therefore, it will not be available at the beginning of winter. It would probably be a matter of three, four months. Uh, just to comment on that, in an idea that would be very temporary, of course, but would cost next to nothing, and with winter coming on, mm -hmm. take the two parking places out there now and just by repainting, turn them into one. Because a lot of people, including myself, have a difficult time parking in one parallel spot. By using the two places for one car, you slide in and you slide out. And have people just simply walk up and use the drop box uh, as it is now, mm -hmm. temporarily. And you know, parking being the problem it is in Birmingham, that to me would relieve the greatest part of the problem of returning books. It's the parking and parking way out there someplace and walking to the library and that would relieve that problem. Mm -hmm. And we can walk up to the Dropbox, that wonderful, sophisticated system you already have in place. That's very, mm -hmm. very good. And, <clears throat> and put a sign up there because we all know that people ignore the five minute parking. And you don't need five minutes, you only need three. I checked it out <laughs> <laughs> and I move very slowly. So it takes three minutes. But put a sign, a visible, good sized sign there that simply says, parking for exterior drop box only. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it would cause a traffic jam because as you come up, if there's a car there, you know, any place in town, if you see a person about to exit a parking spot, what do you do? You stop mm -hmm. and you wait for that person to exit and then you take the parking spot. So that's what would happen here, except this would be very fast and very brief. And I don't think you'd get many people coming at the same time to that. but. No drop box, very simple, but you park right nearby, and I appreciate the library keeping the snow cleared off the sidewalk out there. No problem at all. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, David. David Bloom, I said something before, and it didn't get a whole lot of traction, but when Duani was here, Andres Duani, he commented about places in California where instead of having a ramp, they would have a little button that you would press with the sign that says, if you need help getting into this building, press the button and someone will come and help you. And Birmingham is supposed to be a walkable community, and I liked what E.J. Blackburn just said about being able to park in front if, as long as there was a space and be able to walk up. And the reason for the drop box, as far as I understand, is for people that have accessibility issues getting into the building, whether it's a, it, it's a, it's a disability or whether they're older and, it, or it, and it's bad weather or whether it's a young mother with a stroller trying to drop something off. And so I would just suggest that if you want to have the privilege of using the drop box and then maybe you don't spend 10000 you spend 5000 to put one in plus a cart. Um, and you apply when you have your library card for a permit to use the Dropbox. And there would be certain criteria that you would have to meet for that. And, um, and then it, it's for use for people that need it, not for people that don't need it, because this is still supposed to be a walkable community. Mm -hmm. And again, these books are not only going to have to be taken from the cart, they're going to have to be scanned in by someone at the library and it's going to take time. And if someone scans in a book and it was checked out to, to, to John Doe and John Doe didn't have a permit, well, you'll have an electronic record that the person doesn't have a permit and they checked it in and maybe there's an extra charge that goes on their library card for it. And, and I would look at doing that because the, the purpose of the Dropbox is to help a certain segment of the community. It's not to help everybody and then make life more difficult and more expensive for the library to manage. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I'd like to comment on the uh, one-way street on uh, Merrill. I've been thinking about that all along. I said, why aren't these guys thinking about a one-way street and you can just drive up and drop off the book? If you're handicapped and you have to get out of the car and drop the book off on the other side of your car, how does that help you? I mean, did anybody mm. think about that? It's a question. Oh, oh yeah, we thought about it uh, a lot. Um, 
uh, and I raised the question, is it even worth it? And what most libraries say is that it is, that people still uh, like to have the external book drop, even if it is on the uh, passenger side. Uh, and, and from the beginning, we uh, personally liked the idea of the one-way street on Merrill, but it is uh, difficult to make a change like that in the city of Birmingham. But we did, we used to have one-way streets. I've been long enough in the city to know mm -hmm. the difference. We used to have one-way streets. Why did the city in the first place get rid of one-way streets? And why are they refusing now to put another one-way street and just to drop off books to make it convenient for handicapped people? Mm -hmm. They aren't refusing, Which I don't believe. Being very uh, stubborn, really, basically. This, this was just brought to our attention today so we didn't even explore it with uh, Doug talking to uh, Camila Jane at the community house that they're collaborating right now. So we're very excited that if this does come down the pike and, and the city commission gives its blessing and this could happen, I think it would be great. But this is very new to us. Uh, so that's why you see a lot of the planning. All the time. Uh, said, plan what are they thinking? They're one way street. I mean, what is so difficult? How many brains does it take to think about one way? Right. Then it solves the problem from <laughs> people because we're thinking of people who are di have difficulty dropping off the books. We're not thinking of people who can walk up. Right. No, I think it's a, it's a great idea and I'm glad that they're exploring it and collaborating together and, and hopefully uh, it, we, we see it come come to Baldwin and on, on Merrill. I, th I think it'd be fantastic. Electric card. I think, yeah, the people should have an electric card. Everybody else has electric cards, so why could not the librarians have electric card to push the books? Books are heavy. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it should be made convenient for them. Yeah. Right. Because they are inconvenienced in having to go and get the books, so at least make it convenient to bring them up yeah. without any hint, the difficulties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Camille? Neil Jane, just uh, one thing. The one way also, first of all, happy to go with you and help to get it through if you need it. But from a safety standpoint, that's where our early childhood center children are also dropped off. Actually, not having a two-way street, having to look both ways would be, we could argue, would increase safety. And I do think it would. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. If, peop if you had a three-minute or whatever spot for that, if people were not using the book drop, could they be there for three minutes or no? Um, in in other the words, would they, uh, uh, if they uh, run another errand for, for three minutes. Not, right, if, if they only took three minutes. Because sometimes our parents really are only there for three minutes. They're mm -hmm. getting their kid from the door, things like that. But we would also argue, because I asked my entire staff in every area, today because we thought this might help you all but uh, from a safety standpoint I think it would increase safety so that's a good mm -hmm. argument maybe. yeah I think that's good, good. very good. good thank you uh, um, go ahead yeah come up again sure it's okay that's all right that's why I mentioned the sign I know the people ignore as it is right now they ignore that five minutes Incidentally, Mr. Kosick, the day I talked with you when I went out, I checked, and yes, the same two cars were still sitting there. <laughs> but anyway, the sign would explain that and say, you know, for external drop box only. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people would abuse that if the sign That's is much. right there and it's big enough and they can't miss it. Mm -hmm. We could do a test study with, uh, I think the Friends of the Library have those signs already that we promote things that you could maybe stick out there and see uh, what happens. That helps. Mm -hmm. and, and just just to throw it out there, see how it works, and try it out, and do a little case study, mm -hmm. and then re maybe report back to us and see how it works. Just one last question uh, from me: Do we have a do we have any any idea of just how many times, how many weekends a year that street is closed off? Um. I can't give you an exact number, uh, but I would say probably about uh, 10 days a year. And weekends a year? Three times. Maybe. Are you saying 10 weekends a year? Oh, uh, no, uh, 10 days. 10 days. Yeah. So five weekends a year. It sounds about Well, sometimes uh, during the week, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have the art fair, the carnivals. Yeah, yeah there's uh, a bunch the, of Farm to table. Yeah. So the, the drop box would, mark. would not be usable at those times yes. if under this, in this setup. Okay, thank you. Sheila? I would still like to see us explore um, as soon as possible uh, ways to review um, Merrill 
uh, being converted to a one-way street. Just, you don't have to be at the community house or the library to watch when parents are dropping off little ones. Coming to reading programs, our programs here, um, the book clubs, or going to the community house, um, it's, it's so hazardous. I think on that alone, uh, whether we were doing a drop box or not, I would um, think that uh, the committee and the city would be willing to listen to that. And um, they do safety um, traffic gauges for stop signs in neighborhoods, et cetera, and they kind of move pretty quickly on that. So I would like to see uh, the committee and the community house and other interested folks that we explore this and uh, bring it to the city. Uh, further, ahead. come on up sorry, further. Okay. I think I just better say this, but as a member of a contract community, I would like to think of your drop box as being a matter of convenience for everyone to use and not just people with a permit. Uh, parking often is a problem, and the drop box is expediting everything. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you very much. There's a second on that one. So now, uh, is there any other comment? I think we want to move along here. That was a very good discussion. I appreciate everyone making all those comments, and uh, thank you very much, Doug, and thank you to the public for bringing really new ideas to this subject. We still, let's see, the next thing, uh, Doug, I thought, were you going to summarize the? Yes, I am. Uh, the library board passed a resolution a month ago um, asking the city commission if it wished to participate in a new library building committee. I bought, brought that proposal to the city commission a week ago, uh, September 8th. Um, the city commission ended up not uh, moving the resolution at all, uh, thereby really um, killing for the time being any uh, city commission participation in such a committee. The um, commission made some of these uh, comments uh, that the library needs to rethink the entire project concentrating on needs. Uh, we need to look at the library's mission and 10-year vision. Um, with one exception, the commission was opposed to putting a predetermined cap on the project cost. Um, they were also opposed to spending time and money on uh, further research or surveys. They also believed that uh, it would be better to spend money on a facilitator who would help in the uh, process of developing a, a vision and perhaps uh, coming up with a good plan for the building. Um, one uh, commissioner uh, specifically stated that a committee should be formed without any elected officials on it. Uh, one was concerned about the contract communities and their role in the process. Um, any, uh, any contributions from them toward the building, uh, whether the contract community size should be considered in um, the ideal size for the uh, for an expanded building. And um, then the commission basically turned the matter back to the library board for consideration. Okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna speak, uh, I think for the building committee here, but if members of the building committee uh, you know, wanna add or uh, say something else, feel, feel, feel free to do that. Um, yes, everything, uh, I was at the city commission meeting on September 8th and everything that Doug says is true. Um, I should point out though uh, that the city um, declined to participate in, in really the first phase of the uh, process which is coming up with needs and wants. And, I, and they said uh, Basically, it's your responsibility, library, to come up with the needs and wants and a building program, and then come back and talk to us uh, when you need funding. So it's not that they're dropping me completely out of the process. It's just that they want us to handle the first, the first, first part of the process. So I sort of, uh, I sort of understood what they were saying in that respect. So uh, given that we aren't going to have a joint library committee uh, starting off uh, with the beginning of the process. I believe uh, we should turn to plan B, and we did have a plan B on this. 
which is a library only committee. And the building committee has uh, discussed a library only committee and so, and so, and so, has, so has the board. So uh, I think we should entertain uh, uh, this library only committee. Now, Doug has, Doug has provided a draft motion which was passed out to board, to be, to board members, and I, uh, I think you all, I, you know, I think you all have it. And it says, um, the, the motion is to form a Baldwin Library Ad Hoc Committee to explore options for improving the library building. The committee will consist of seven members, the library's building committee plus members of the public selected by the library board from self-nominated individuals. Other, uh, r other recommendations are included in the proposal below. below. The library envisions that the committee will start meeting by the, by the, you know, by the end of the year. Um, I should uh, point out that uh, there are really two parts to this process. Let's just take a look at this process. There's really, there's really part one, which is to revise the building program and to develop a long-term facility plan and part two on the second page is to actually develop a phase one project. And that is where going back to the city uh, is required because the city controls the funding. So I think what we should do as a board here is to discuss the motion that, uh, that Doug has drafted here. Um, I'm in favor of some sort of a motion. It doesn't have to be exactly this, but why don't we go ahead and talk about it and see if we want to um, pass something, n something like this. I suggest we not get too uh, detailed into the, the two-page attached process because um, I see some things in there that perhaps we might want to talk about changing. But so look at that two-page process as an approximate uh, charge to this in the committee, but we still have, but we still have to tweak it. So let me just start th throwing it open here about the motion. I, I'll go first. I, I don't really agree with, I agree with seven members being part of the committee, but I don't agree with three of the building committee uh, board members being on that committee. I think I'm leaning a little bit more towards one of the commissioner, city commissioners that really keep elected officials out of it. Maybe just have one elected official uh, be part of this because it's gonna give us a broad base uh, sentiment of what the residents want and I really think that we should have our contract communities part of this also because one of the other commissioners recommended possible funding or whatnot and and I think that it is a city owned uh, uh, property building and so forth but we want their input and I'm not saying that they I've always felt that I don't want to go to the city of Bloomfield Hills or Beverly Hills to ask them to fund uh, any uh, renovation project here but I think that it would be valid to have them on the committee so it would just give us a more broad base uh, committee and I, trust me I, it, for whatever I'm on a building committee I would come to the meetings and participate and listen and, and be interactive uh, but I really think to get the scope of what we need is to limit the elected officials and have the residents uh, uh, really almost like the, uh, the cemetery uh, committee how that worked I thought that worked out really well. Yeah, by the way, um, I, I did some research on the cemetery committee, and uh, in fact, I had coffee with George Stern today, and I talked about it, and he sort of enlightened me. Um, this city really made a lot of uh, specifications and requirements for those, seven, for those seven members, and I think we all ought to review the details of how the cemetery committee was set up before we start using it as an example. Okay. And others? Yeah. Sheila. Well, I was unable to go to the city commission meeting. Um, I reviewed it twice on uh, the website. I've talked to a couple of city commissioners. Um, and I wasn't that disappointed that the city said they uh, weren't going to participate as city commissioners on the board. Um, because they, as they pointed out, uh, when they dealt with park situations, uh, there weren't elected officials on the, the park boards. As we are elected officials on the library board, it is our responsibility to handle uh, library issues, library vision, 
planning, et cetera. So um, I thought they made it perfectly clear that um, they would expect us to be reporting on the process um, and regularly reporting and dialoguing, uh, but that it's our responsibility as elected library board um, trustees to deal with this. Uh, before we get into a committee, though, I think um, I'm, I'm all for not delaying, but I'm also for reviewing where we are before we set up a committee. We're at the point we're supposed to do a, a review of our strategic plan, which has guided us very well. Um, and I might mention that most people overlook our mission. That was brought up at the City Commission. This is a pretty timeless uh, mission statement and vision, and that's what good libraries are about. Uh, and so to, and I believe Trustee Harris, who could not be here tonight, also mentioned that he thought it would be pertinent or uh, important to review our strategic plan uh, and to look at our 10-year vision and then to go ahead after we've sifted through all that we did for the research and the committee and then uh, I would suggest delaying till uh, next month to look into a committee but first to set up reviewing our strategic plan and um, working whether it's special meetings on our 10-year vision I'd just like to uh, read out uh, the library's mission vision core values determined by the strategic plan adapted adopted four years ago uh, the Baldwin Public Library enriches Birmingham and participating communities by providing opportunities and resources for individuals of all ages and backgrounds to learn connect and discover in other words it's an educational uh, institution a gathering spot uh, the Baldwin Public Library will be an essential resource for the community and its first choice for accessing the world's knowledge. That's well, the vision. That's, that's the vision. The vision. And core values are intellectual freedom, equitable and inclusive access, education and learning, welcoming environment, integrity, partnerships, excellence. Um, I think these are quite broad statements. I would be fairly surprised if they uh, would change significantly as we review the strategic plan. Uh, the real issue is how these are converted into plans, specific plans for the building. Yeah, let me say something about the, the vision. I think uh, people, including some of the city the commissioners, first of all, they were mixing up vision with mission. Um, and we're really talking vision here. And the concept that the building committee came up with for the vision is a 10-year vision of what the library facility should look like 10 years from now, given technological trends and the internet and what's happening with, uh, uh, with hard copy materials and uh, technological materials. So I think we should just get this all straight. We're talking about a 10-year vision for the facility which would guide whatever process we set up to come up with building changes. So I think that the mission, vision, core values you read there are almost timeless, and I don't recommend changing them. But let's focus on a building vision and uh, put it together possibly with the help of some building professionals, maybe someone from Wayne State University or University of, of Michigan, what do they think of a, a library facility and its materials will look like in 10, in 10 years? That's what the building committee wants uh, done the in library terms of vision. closes in 15 minutes. If you wish to check out materials, well, please bring them to the circulation The commissioners suggested, uh, well, they time. came out strongly please against a survey, and, uh, and uh, many of us felt that station. we didn't need another survey, um, but that they suggested a facilitator, and uh, that'd be something also closing. that I think we could Thank you. Um, look into as soon as possible, to have someone help facilitate meetings with the public, uh, meetings with our board, to go over. I mean, we have uh, such, such a wealth of information that was uh, you know recorded in three years and to sift through all that and uh, refine where we're going and looking at um, what what are our basic needs uh, that we can do short term and what what are we going to have to plan for long term because we have some pressing needs uh, I recall it's been over a decade uh, oh, longer than that I don't know uh, maybe 15 years, that adult services was promised to have 
um, up-to-date um, a state where the adult librarians are. You go to Canton, you go to West Bloomfield, um, and those libraries have been um, rejuvenated recently, but what they've done where their adult librarians are, um, it's, it's a totally different ball game. And uh, I think given our employees and what they have to deal with with different patrons uh, and different needs, by the hour, that's something that's long overdue, but it would be a short-term need. Um, so I can't see forming a committee to look at that. To me, that would be something taken care of with administration, just like we're taking care of the book drop, um, the elevator, but some of those real pressing needs that we have had on the back burner due to the economy uh, and due to um, our recent attempt at the bond. I, I agree with Sheila. I think she makes a lot of sense maybe hiring a consultant to come in and look at our space. We, George Lawson did a good job, but maybe we need another set of eyes to come in and repurpose the space. Maybe a little bit, you know, we have a lot of space here that's being underutilized, make it more flexible. Uh, maybe we start uh, taking the lead of like Austin, Texas and, and moving some of our adult print into more technology, freeing up spaces. We don't really want to take print away from the youth and so forth, but Maybe have a consultant come in and just see how we can maybe, or you know, remanage the space we have and make it more uh, flexible to fit some of the needs that we need going forward with the existing footprint. I think Sheila, you were talking about a facilitator to the process. Mm -hmm. I think Frank is talking about a consultant to advise us on how to better utilize a library building. So let's just get that straight too. There's yeah. two different concepts. Right. Right. Okay. right. Understood. Well, I, I'd like to clarify one <coughs> question here. Um, you referred to reviewing the strategic plan or updating the strategic plan. And that's the plan that was put together four years ago, uh, um, facilitated by DESC, I think. Um, and um, updating that or revising that or redoing that um, seems to me possibly a diversion from um, the issue of planning the, f the um, future of the physical building. Um, the last time we did that, it was at least a year and a half process, I believe. Um, are we suggesting another a delay of a year and a half before? Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I think if you look on page 24, and I'll certainly let um, Jim Suhey is an expert in strategic planning, but you look at our strategic plan quarterly status reports. It's right. on 24. Right. I don't see it. Um, I mean, that's it's been so vital in in our template and how we operate. But I certainly don't see a review. Um, taking that long at all. I don't know, Jim, what would you say? Uh, what uh, would be... Doug, I think you and the staff have already talked about it. We aren't talking about a total rewrite. We're talking about an update. So why don't you... I think you've talked about that, haven't you? Uh, yes, yes, we have talked about it. And no, uh, we are not talking about a complete uh, redo of the strategic plan. Our uh, basic goals, objectives would remain the same. Uh, the... the um, process would simply be updated. Uh, you know, what have we accomplished? What remains to be done? Uh, some things are, uh, are basically done. The uh, financial stability portion of it, I think we have, we have exceeded at. Uh, the building um, portion of the plan simply stated that we needed to explore options for the building. Well, we still are doing that. Uh, we're really still at uh, home base there. I wouldn't say home base because we've done research, uh, but we're uh, not yet at first base really in, in terms of anything practical. So uh, this would be, uh, I we were really looking at it as primarily a staff-based revision with some input from the, um, from the library board. This 10-year vision for the library building I think is something different. It is more or less a, uh, a, a tangent off of the uh, building portion of the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That, that's what that, I was that helped me clarify. I, I thought there were two separate things going on here, and I, I wanted to tease them apart. Um, you know, uh, it, it, we uh, uh, Bob in the in the um, joint uh, library committee uh, meetings. 
um, both members of the board, uh, members of the committee, and staff in the library, um, and individual bo library board members on their own, um, many people looked at many different libraries around the country. Um, many reports were looked at, you know, ALA reports, for example, the library of the future, uh, what a library is going to look like 10 years from now. Uh, we've got reams and reams and reams of this, of this kind of material. A great deal of work has been done. Um, so I'm, um, when, 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 when I hear what sounds like specific projects to hire a consultant to tell us what a library is going to look like 10 years from now, don't we already have this information? Why do we, do we need a consultant to uh, sort through the information we have? Uh, I'll stop here and see what other people have to say. I do, I do agree with you. We have a lot of research and the city, I agree with, I didn't agree with, I really wanted the city as part of a joint library building committee, but they also said, said some things I agreed with, which is you already have enough research don't don't run a survey don't run any more focus groups uh, you have enough but we really haven't gotten the grips with this concept of what a library looks like 10 years from now we do have we do have a study and from my point of view the library of the future that study that we had didn't give me a, a good idea of what we should be planning for 10 years from now so res uh, additional research no except that I would like to spend some time on coming up with what the library looks like 10 years from now so we can build towards it as opposed to doing a bunch of haphazard uh, uh, standalone projects. May I um, talk about a few ideas that I've had uh, recently? Please, Please. do. Apologize for this meeting tonight taking so long, but this is so important. So, <clears throat> I'm going to try to. I hope that the. Uh, I hope that the image will uh, stay on the screen. Um, you know, three, four years ago, when I first talked to the library board and the city commission, I said I saw three paths. One was basically to do nothing for the building except uh, make sure that it is uh, the tight machine, and, uh, and, and, and functional, are um, now closed. physically the tight. Library closes now, we in still have issues minutes. with the ceiling leaks. We're uh, dealing with them. There was the freight elevator. There's a, a plan in progress for that. Uh, we make sure that if a chair is ripped up that it gets repaired or replaced. Uh, that is the minimal approach to the library building. The second approach is basically taking the same space, perhaps adding on a little bit, but upgrading it both in terms of functionality and looks. The third option was to really go back to square one and look at what a library of our size and nature should be. Somewhat to my surprise, the city commission uh, along with some other people in the community did go with a third option and we ended up going off on a very long project and coming up with a uh, detailed plan that uh, was defeated at the polls by quite a large margin in May. All we can say for sure is that path did not succeed. Um, I, I have to say that I was somewhat looking forward to a survey to try to figure out uh, why it didn't succeed. Uh, we're not evidently not going to do that and so I can say that my interpretation of it is that it was simply too expensive. There were other reasons too that many other that people had but the safe uh, thing to say is that people didn't want to spend the money on it. Uh, I'm concerned about heading off into another planning process and getting into a uh, mode of planning, uh, spending time, spending money on planning and always planning and never doing. Um, 
I go back even further. Uh, nearly 14 years ago, the library director at that time um, and the library board hired an architect, and we spent quite a bit of money back then uh, for that architect to take a look at the Burkert's edition. At that point, work had already been done on the Grand Hall and the Youth Room, either done or was planned, and the next stage was going to be the Burkert's edition, which has not really been upgraded since it opened in 1982. I'd like to uh, to stress that, we still have the same carpet there in most of that part of the building uh, that we had on opening day in 1982. Um, something as basic as that has not been touched. And a lot of time was spent back then reviewing uh, the Burkert's edition, uh, coming up with some ideas, and then nothing ever developed. Uh, other parts of the building were touched, but not that. Uh, if I had to put, uh, if I had to name one section of the library that really needed to be done at this point, it would be the Burkert's edition. So I'd like to propose something. Uh, instead of trying to look at the whole building and coming up with a whole plan, uh, even one that costs uh, less, less money and, and fixes certain of the other things that might have been wrong with the um, uh, plan that was rejected in May. Uh, let's really seriously consider putting this into stages. We've paid some lip service to it, but let's really seriously consider it. Move certain things more or less off the table in the short term and just concentrate on one, uh, one part of the building. And my suggestion would be the, uh, would be the Burkert's addition. So once again, I'm going to move uh, away from the microphone slightly. Uh, or for a very short period of time just to point out what I'm talking about. On the east side of the building, we have the children's room. We also have the entrance to the library. We have the circulation department. My proposal is that uh, that become stage two, or it might be stages two and three, dealing with issues that are important um, and we want to deal with eventually, like, the entrance to the library, uh, handicap entrance to the library, the amount of space needed for the youth room, uh, the location of the circulation desk, which really should be closer to the, to the door. Uh, I propose that in the short term, we concentrate on the Burkert's edition and for a limited extent, the Grand Hall. So basically, this part of the library, to the west of the library, making tweaks to the Grand Hall, uh, concentrating on the uh, adult... The library is now closed. It will reopen tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. So just to repeat uh, what I had to say uh, off microphone, we would be... Um, my proposal is to concentrate right now on the adult services department in the Burkert's edition and the Grand Hall. Um, and to keep until a somewhat later date any changes to the entrance to the library, uh, to the children's room. Uh, this is the area that looks out over Shane Park that most closely uh, touches on or comes close to the community house. It's the area where Andres Duani had various ideas that I think are floating around but have not uh, gelled yet in the community. So what kinds of things would we then do in the adult services department? We'd take a look at how many physical materials we need now and plan for that. Uh, take a look at the number of computers we need and plan for that. Uh, take a look at any other technology um, infrastructure things we, we ought to do. Um, we should come up with a an adult services desk. They've been waiting for it for over a decade. Uh, you know, redo the carpeting, paint, uh, look at staff space, and then whatever is left and wherever we can claw out space, use that for study space, uh, both open seating and study room space, the small study rooms that have been so successful at other libraries. Uh, collaboration space, and then anything else that we can come up with in the 10-year vision. But I'd really like us to try to bite off something that we can chew and at least accomplish something 
that will give a sense of uh, satisfaction to the community and that can perhaps uh, give them confidence that whatever we propose next is worth the money and whatever does come next in stages two and three would be something certainly much less ambitious than what was proposed earlier in the year. So that is my, uh, my recommendation. Uh, you know, whether or not there is a committee um, that would be advising us on this, we would definitely need staff input. We would definitely want public input. The process would be transparent. Uh, we want to make sure that we are uh, fulfilling for this portion of the building the 10-year vision. I want to point out that this assumes that there will be no changes to those portions of the building eventually. You know, we were criticized before for having made changes in the last decade and then you talked about uh, tearing them up again for the new building. Uh, just, you know, this building is going to be our building for, for the long term. The uh, original 1927 building we were going to keep anyway because it's such a classic, people want it. The Burkert's edition, whatever your opinion about it, is the one that we have and the voters have said we're keeping it. So any changes made to these portions of the building would not be affected then uh, in a possible stage two or stage three. So hey, thank you for hearing my views. Hey Doug. Um, Thank you for stating them. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, that does give us another uh, uh, alternative to look at, and I think it gives us a little fresh thinking, so thank you. Uh, I have one question I'd like your opinion on. Do you think that to proceed with this, basically we have most of this on the shelf. We have the Fannie and Howie plan from uh, 2012, I, I believe, which, like you said, started this whole process. Do we need a new formal committee which is the expansion of the building committee to include community members. Do we need to form a new committee to proceed with this, or can we do it just with staff and the building, building committee working on it with input along the way from the public? Uh, we don't absolutely need it. Uh, up until a few years ago, the, the way the process would have been carried out is that staff would have brought ideas to the library board. The library board would have made the final decision. I think there's so much interest from the public that we have to make sure, uh, especially sure now that we're transparent, that we get input from the public, whether it is done through a formal committee or just through uh, a, a series of uh, public uh, hearings, so to speak, uh, you know, library board meetings, let everyone know that it's going to be talked about and, and the public is welcome to, uh, to cast their vote, so to speak, on, on these matters. And I, I do want to um, state again, this is, one purpose of this is to bite off a part of the total project that probably will not be hugely expensive. We're talking in terms of hundreds of thousands of dollars rather than multiple millions of dollars. I totally agree with you, Doug. I think you really did a great job to focus on this area. Uh, I, I, I look forward to moving along with this. I think it's a clear vision. We know that the uh, 1927 and the Burkert's edition isn't going anywhere, so we're not wasting tax taxpayers' money for whatever we accomplish. It is dated. I don't know if we need uh, all those large books, or are they getting used, or DVDs. Maybe we need to, you know, sh there's a lot of valuable space over there that we can accomplish some of the needs that we're lacking. Well, uh, I mean, it's time. It would be prudent to reconsider everything. Um, the research that we did a couple of years ago was fine research, but uh, trends have, have changed. Um, you know, number of computers we need, we would have to look at. Uh, number of physical items, we'd have to take a look at current circulation trends. Uh, in the original, um, in, in not in the original plan, but in the uh, plan that was brought to the voters uh, last May, uh, we called for a reduction in the number of physical items in the adult services department by 10 percent. No reduction in the youth department, but a reduction of about 10 percent in, um, in adult services. Uh, we'd have to look now to see if that is accurate. 
whatever we do, it's going to change in the future. I mean, a 10-year vision is about as far out as we can go, and I can tell you that if we had come up with uh, a 10-year vision in 2004, that it would not be exactly what, uh, it would not suit exactly what we have in uh, 2014. So let's be prepared for changes in the future. I personally see the physical collections uh, shrinking further in the future. So if the issue is the amount of study and collaboration space that we need, even if we end up with less now, uh, there should be possibility in the future to expand that. For example, um, what is now the teen area uh, used to be largely the um, well, it, it, it was made possible by the, uh, by the weeding of the reference collection. Mm -hmm. no, I, and earlier in the evening, I know that we talked about a facilitator and I talked about a consultant. This is what I mean by hiring a, a consultant to come in and just say, okay, let's focus on this area. Let's make this space that maybe we're not using it to the best of our ability, make it more flexible with collaboration rooms, open it up more. And I think you're, you're on the right track. And we'll be able to bring a, 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 a better product to our community and our contract communities a lot quicker uh, with this mm -hmm. process. Yeah. And I think, I think you mentioned that we could include in this plan the conversion of the lavatory rooms in the Grand Hall from miscellaneous storage to study yeah. rooms. Well, it, it certainly is something to consider. And, uh, the, and, and, and I think with all of these, we would have to get uh, a feeling from whomever we hire, which, whichever architect, interior designer, et cetera, how much it costs and weigh that against uh, what we get for it. Yeah, and the Griffin Room, too, uh, we talked about converting from a, a quiet reading room into uh, a study room, correct? We can look at yeah, that. Yeah, we, we've talked about okay, it, so and, and there are other options, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. just, mm -hmm. just, just so we are misleading people, though, remember the, the Fanning Howie renovation uh, had a uh, cost range of 2.5 to 3 million. So I'm not sure it's as little as a couple right. hundred thousand. Uh, now that did include, uh, I think it was about 2.4 yeah. million if you did not add any, um, any space to the building and that included the youth area as well as the yes. adult area. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to remember that uh, 13, 14 years ago when the other architect was involved, um, the price estimate for bringing Burkert's up to snuff was about $1 million. I don't know uh, where that number came from, um, you know, whether it was planned out in detail, but uh, that would kind of correspond to what we're, we're seeing here. Um, you know, $1 million in 2001 uh, could well be about a million and a half dollars in uh, 2014, 15, uh, and just remember, I mean, what, what, whatever we have, we can uh, prioritize and make uh, something good out of it. Uh, even if this is too much, if a project of one and a half million is, is too much and we cannot find the money for it, we do have some money in the fund balance and in the trust that can be used to accomplish some things. I, I think you're on the right track, Doug. Yeah, what Very do you good. recommend as the next uh, steps then, Doug? Uh, well, I, uh, I, like I've presented some ideas and other people presented ideas this evening. I, I think that they need to be uh, mulled over and no decision made on these tonight. But um, I mean, since I'm the one who suggested it, I would like uh, clearly to proceed with the idea, unless there is opposition from other quarters, to try to do something that is smaller scale uh, so that we can accomplish something worthwhile. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, that we were sounding defeated and there was no need to, to sound defeated. Um, I mean, we have spent three years uh, talking about the building and not really accomplished anything during that time. So I think it would be good to uh, be able to accomplish something worthwhile. Okay. Yeah. Good. I would agree with that. I yeah. agree. Great. I like that. Accomplish something. Uh, I, I want to try a slightly different suggestion here. Um, this library board has developed a considerable wealth of knowledge 
about libraries, about building procedures, about uh, nobody knows what the library is going to look like 10 years from now. That uh, it, it, you can find 25 consultants to give you 25 different plans for that. Um, but 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 the the process we've just gone through and completed the several year process. Um, this library board had a um, did not have a leadership role per se in in making decisions or recommendations on that. We it was a broader, more collaborative effort with the city commission and others. Um, it seems to me that we are really charged with looking at our responsibility for picking up the ball and doing what needs to be done. And to that extent, I don't think we should make any decisions about anything tonight. There are lots of things to be done. There are ways of accomplishing them. But I would like to see some informal brainstorming sessions over the next couple of months involving members of the public um, and members of the library board, something fairly loosely structured um, that brainstorming sessions in the 70s and 80s in a corporate environment often had very successful results. And I wonder if we shouldn't be looking at something like that on a short-term basis to help focus uh, the attention of this library board so we can pick up the ball and carry out our responsibilities. I think you should set up a building committee uh, date so we can meet and we might have to meet twice between now and the next meeting but I think we've gone over a lot of information that we need to digest tonight and uh, bring it back to the board after uh, a month and, and have a couple of building committee meetings with the public and have uh, people engaged and uh, I think we're on the right path. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and you. Doug, yeah, I, you know, I strongly urge you to, to put something down uh, in terms of how you envision this process rolling out and maybe mm -hmm. what we should should do and let the and let the billing committee review it as opposed to uh, sort of starting out with a, you know with nothing on a piece of paper but give us something to start with very good I'm done okay I guess and I guess we don't have to look at the motion anymore but and yeah. um, at 915 there I open this to yes Go ahead. I, I yeah, even though we don't have a motion, I think that uh, we need to hear from the public. Yes, Absolutely. that's what I think we should do next. So if there's anyone that would like to speak, please come forth. Raise your hand. Come forth. Camille, please. All right, I got to get going. I have no clout in saying anything. I realize that. But one, I'd say listen to Doug. I mean, <laughs> he knows about libraries. I really do. I agree. I would say hallelujah if the commission doesn't want to be involved in this. <laughs> I really would. You have a board of trustees that are elected. I mean, I'm relatively new back in the community, but you folks can get this done. You're all really smart and you're really good. You don't know what the library of the future is going to be because no one does. You just have to maintain f flexibility. I agree with getting input from the public as long as you listen to them, you know. But you can do this quickly. I and Jim knows he was on our board, but when I came to the community house and we hadn't been redone in 15, 18 years, we were tired and there was this proposal in front of me that said all these consultants coming in, $475,000 to redecorate the community house. We did it in $72,000. So, you know, you just, and I know that because we don't have tax dollars, maybe we have to dig a little deeper, but you folks know how to do this. And um, you also can, can look to people uh, who are retired and very knowledgeable. I mean, I, I, I just say that, not that he'd do anything, but having been married to a space planning architect for 30 years, there's a lot of knowledge out there. You don't have to pay a lot of money for consultants. I would just be very careful about that. But I think you know what you're doing. I think you folks should all listen, be involved, let us be involved. But the other last thing I want to say is, you know, our youth groups and, and our early childhood center at Dance Academy are in the lower level. And parents like that because they're already in the shelter. Honestly, if any, honestly, seriously. 
we have a waiting list a mile long in our ECC, and when people first kind of go, oh, you're in the lower level. But we say if there's any bad weather, if there's, God forbid, anything terrible going on, the kids are already in the lower level. And, you know, y you might consider the, the, the youth things down here just because, you know, yeah, there are no windows, but they're in the basement of everybody's house anyway. So, right. anyway, but thank you. Good night. Thank you, Camille. Thank you, Camille. Anyone else would like to speak? Go ahead, Pat. Come forth, please. Pat Hardy, contract community here, because I don't have a report to give tonight. So instead of giving a report, I just want to weigh in on some of what I've heard you say this evening. Um, so the fact that the public, that your residents here, rejected the price of your of your remodeling, uh, the, the library that you all thought you really wanted, the fact that that was rejected is okay, because it was the beginning of a process. It was the beginning, it's not the end. Um, I think the idea that you came up with the space planner, getting someone to really review the space and see it, if it's being used the best way, that's idea number one where you have to start. Frank, you said that more voices from the community should be heard rather than the elected officials. I think you're absolutely right. Not that you shouldn't be a part of it, but Really, it's the public that is most concerned with what's going to go on here. Um, you mentioned a survey, not maybe wanting to spend the money on a survey or a survey idea was not the right idea. You put out a monthly newsletter. And if you had a tear-off sheet on that monthly newsletter to get people who really, to get the people out there who are really interested in what's going on here, to fill it out and come to some fireside chat meetings up in the beautiful room you have or somewhere for informal discussions. I think that's going to bring the community together. You're going to bounce all, off wonderful ideas from people who really care about this library. They use it. They care about it. And that's the wealth of this community that you have. So those are just... Um, if you're ever going to call it a commun uh, another committee, just call it Library Improvement Committee, mm -hmm. Library of the Future Improvement Committee. But I think, as Camille just said, you've got all the answers right here. I don't think you'd ever have to pay a consultant a lot of money because you've got consultants right in your community. Get them together. Facilitator, yes. Space planner, yes. But these are just my ideas. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Anyone else? All right. Well, I would finally say we've come to some sensible ideas, and I certainly appreciate what you said uh, tonight. Um, by filling in one area, starting with one step, and then moving forward. The only one thing I haven't heard that I've heard outside discussions about, are we going to fix the roof too? <laughs> That going to no. be part of the project? Uh, that is, uh, um, we are currently, uh, what we have been talking about this evening is uh, what the library board is responsible for, which is basically the interior of the library and all of the programming and activities going on in the library. The physical building does belong to the city of Birmingham, and we certainly have listed the um, uh, roof leaks as an issue that we would like them to look into and resolve. Yeah. Uh, they have said that they would. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds good. But anyway, I really appreciate what you said tonight. Thank it's you. like getting any repairman. Sometimes you have to call them ten times. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> Especially on a building this big. <laughs> and it's old. <laughs> Um, I think there's been a very good dialogue tonight um, and some good back and forth and some good suggestions. Um, I think going forward, having some other discussions in the building committee and figuring out what um, we're going to do uh, makes sense. Um, there have been some comments made about you don't need to bring in consultants. Um, I'm not so sure. There was a conversation that took place yesterday with a the, with the nationally and internationally well-known 
library consultant and that person made some very good points about what could be done and I would think before before a lot is done or before a committee is, is set up that you really want to have someone else come in take another look at the loss and plan take another look at a potential program and then see what what makes sense for going forward and try and and, and this particular consultant didn't feel that f felt that um, a lot of the needs of the library including the contract communities can be met within the existing footprint but it does need to be tested out um, in terms of forming a committee I just want to direct people to a it was a letter written by Robert Harrison and Associates in uh, April 4, 2006, which was at that time the attorneys for the library, and it was written to the previous library director, um, and it said, Establishment Appointment of Library Committees, um, and the note was, um, Dear Ms. Custer, you have asked Robert Harrison and Associates to provide you with our legal opinion with regard to the question raised by the library board concerning whether the legal authority to appoint library committees rests with the full board or with the president of the board. And the opinion states, we have examined the bylaws of the board of directors for the Baldwin Public Library, portions of the Birmingham City Charter, the Birmingham City Ordinances, and provisions of the Home Rule City Act, um, yada, 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 the Michigan Constitution of 1963 and the Open Meetings Act that we have deemed relevant to our this opinion. Based on the above and subject to the qualifications set forth below, it is our opinion that Number one, the power to establish and appoint committees for the Baldwin Public Library rests solely with the president of the board of directors. The opinion is based on the following factors, and um, I don't know if, if uh, Doug has a copy of this, but I can leave this with you and you can copy it and get it. I'd answer. appreciate it. Okay, so um, good luck on the endeavor. Um, I'm happy to be a part of the process. Uh, I think just we need to all work together, uh, make sure our, we're spending our money wisely, and to have a great library. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Anyone else have any comments? Moving right along. Uh, could we uh, mm -hmm. perhaps for the time being uh, delay the library report and skip to uh, the liaisons? Uh, Pat has already said that she doesn't have any report. Uh, Pam is here and uh, she's been waiting patiently, so perhaps Thank we you. should let her give her report first. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Pam. Come forward. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that, that listening to the board tonight, I, I'm so impressed that we have such a, a, a deliberative and dedicated board. And I, I just um, am very glad to be in this community and, uh, and have people that, that are, are so thoughtful. Um, it does seem like we're moving towards a more incremental, problem-focused approach, which sounds like maybe the direction to go. In terms of the friends, um, I wanted to say that when I, I was at the first day of the uh, summer reading program this summer, and it was so wonderful to see all the parents, all the children, um, how busy it was, and it made, um, I think, me and the other members of the friends feel really good that we um, have, the money, have been providing money to support programs like that. Uh, as well as the book clubs and, and some of the other things um, that are going on. And um, we are now uh, sending out our membership renewal and we, the book, uh, the next book sale is November um, 7th, 8th, and 9th, right around the corner. And we're working on that. We're, we're flooded with books and frustrated about our lack of space, but we're, <laughs> we're soldiering on. And um, we hope that everybody will come. And we want to remind people that that Friday night is for members only, and you get first first dibs on on the good books. Um, and we need uh, we had a resignation on the board, and we need a new person on our board. So if anybody has any ideas about that, that would be that would be great too. So thank you. Thank you, Pam. And uh, uh, do we go back now to the library report? The library report. On um, page 24 of the library report is a slightly revised dashboard uh, for fiscal year 2013-14. Um, since the first dashboard was produced, we have received um, uh, 
additional revenues and also incurred some additional expenses. Items have, uh, have drifted in, and so this version reflects the final end of the year uh, budget, and it actually makes our situation a little bit better. Revenue especially has come up so that we are nearly at the target, just a few thousand dollars below the target. As everyone here is aware, we uh, started a, uh, an architectural collection, 100 essential architecture books. Um, recently, a donation was made from Ralph uh, Moxley, originally from Birmingham, of uh, 23 books from the collection of Clifford uh, Holforty. And those books are being added to our uh, general collection, not to the 100 essential architecture books, uh, but they are really nice books in pristine condition and we were very glad for this donation. And now I'm turning it over to Catherine. I'm very excited to announce that it is official that the um, Townsend Hotel will be doing a fundraiser for the library October 18th. It is Tea at the Townsend with Madeline, celebrating the 75th anniversary of the publication of the Madeline books. Um, so there will be tea and food that are both adult and children appropriate. Uh, there will be a candy station for the kids, photos with Madeline, and a story time from a youth librarian. Tickets are $35 and can be reserved um, at the Townsend. And I'm going to make sure all of the board members and all of uh, the friends tell all of their friends because we only have about a month and we only solidified the marketing this morning. <laughs> so I have faith that we'll be able to, to fill the room for a great cause and hopefully a great event. Um, also, um, last month, adult librarian Katie Rothley attended a, a, a workshop to be a facilitator for the Michigan Libraries for Life Organ Donation Registration Drive, which the library will be doing in October, and there's more details in this month's books, books and beyond. Um, we also had a visit from someone whose name I'm going to butcher, and I apologize. Hopefully he cannot see this in Japan. Um, Seisho Yamamoto who um, was the, the representative from Rito, Japan, which is the library's sister city in Japan. Um, and he stepped by and we gave him a little tour and he donated a, um, a, a board game called Rito Lateria, which several of us played together. It was a lot of fun. It's kind of like bingo, except um, it has, instead of numbers and letters, it has little pictures of, and descriptions of places in Rito, Japan. So you can learn a little bit about the town. Um, Birmingham and Stitches is now tentatively scheduled to reappear next year. That's the yarn bombing event that they did in the city of Birmingham last year. Um, it should, it's scheduled right now um, for installation May 13th through 15th and with a kickoff on May 16th. And the library is tentatively also a host site for that. Um, and then finally, there were some issues last week with the front doors of the library at first closing too fast and then eventually not closing enough. But the library did, uh, or the city did eventually um, send people out to fix both of those issues, as well as there was an adult, a leak in adult services last week during the heavy rain, and they're supposed to send someone out to look at that as well. Okay. Okay. The liaisons, I think we've done all that. I do believe there should be a, a short report from Connie Ilmer oh on the summer gracious. reading program. Yes, 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 we passed that. And that is always a highlight of the year. <laughs> Sorry you had to wait so long, Connie. <laughs> you guys have had me here be here as well. <coughs> there are um, extended reports in your board packet, so I'm going to address a few things that aren't uh, in there or just summarize some of them. Our summer was very successful again. Uh, people still like to come to this library. Our, we had a science theme this year. The youth theme was Fizz Boom Read. The teen theme was Spark a Reaction. And the adult was Literary Elements. The themes were all about science, and there was consideration given to that in all of our programming. Youth services followed the guidelines of STEM, which the schools use when developing all of our materials, and STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. So um, all, just about every program, including our activity centers, related to those issues. We had over 400 people attend the Summer Reading Open House on June 13th. It was the first day of summer vacation for the public schools. 
and we also have online registration and we've had that for several years um, so people don't have to come into the library to register but we do like to, them to come in and get their prizes and pick their books this year we had 1,299 participants in summer reading that's a 4% increase over last year and 94% of those participants were either residents of our service communities or attend the Birmingham Public Schools so that's really we really serve our local area 53% uh, of the participants were Birmingham residents and that's actually up quite a bit from last year and Beverly Hills 26% uh, Bingham Farms 1% and Bloomfield Hills 6% as well and those are about what they were last year school outreach and cooperation was strong again this year youth services and teen services staff visited all nine grade schools and one middle school in the district making 51 presentations and reaching 3,792 students directly and more indirectly by a video that we made over at Pierce um, advertising the um, summer reading program that they could play on their um, closed uh, circuit televisions in the schools um, the, the uh, library had 149 programs or events across the course of the summer and we served 7,710 people which is a 6% increase over last year which was also up quite a bit um, some program highlights adult services uh, people were very enthusiastic when they came to sign up for an adult services and we had many many comments that they really liked the whole family coming in and registering um, adults teens and youth in one family so we'll probably look at even strengthening that next year uh, to uh, d um, serve the families like that we offered a variety of programs with science tie-ins including forensic art perennials gardening music and automobiles and the summer reading finale uh, featured Jerry Burton he's an author associate creative director at MRM McCann and an automotive historian there's a picture of him in your board packet he presented a very colorful history of the Corvette and a person responsible for uh, making the reputation of the Corvette really as um, popular to, as it was through the years and that's Zora Arcus Zunoff uh, Jerry has written a book about this gentleman he donated two copies to adult services to use as prizes and he has even traveled to Russia um, working on a documentary that's going to be produced there on this gentleman the teens uh, all together read over 600 books this summer the teen uh, reading uh, summer reading prizes were awarded at their finale which was a teen glow party and there's a picture of that in your board and we had the whole downstairs uh, just lit with glow sticks and it was really a lot of fun the kids had a good time but I think the most popular program in the summer was the visit by the actress Mila Govich who is a Birmingham resident and she is a featured star in the wildly popular music movie um, the fault of our stars she plays the mother of the young boy who uh, dies of cancer in the movie so we and there's a framed signed mini poster from her up in the teen scene and it's uh, you want to take a look at it it's really special um, also the teens had uh, at their finale an award for their most avid reader which was given to George Kalarchik and he read 146 books this summer <laughs> youth services was um, able to provide several programs that featured outside performers or organizations but I think the programs created by our own um, talented youth staff continue to be the heart of the summer reading and I believe that's what really draws the children to Baldwin we also took the library out into the community this summer we visited preschools we did story times at the YMCA and the farmers market and um, those seem to be very popular this year there were two new additions to youth programming that uh, also proved popular we um, produced 16 different um, technology programs uh, with the youth staff um, a lot of those were Minecraft sessions that were done down here in the um, computer lab we have a site license for Minecraft like the schools do 
And um, the point of the, those sessions is really collaboration, and the kids were wonderful with that. And um, youth librarian Stephanie Miller and our technology trainer, Bart Joya, did an awful lot to facilitate that. Then we were very lucky to have Stephanie on our staff because we also produced, and I think we're the only library around that has done this so far, we had Raspberry Pi um, sessions here, which are tiny computers, and they use the Python computer language, and they're designed for um, students, youth, adults, to, um, through exploration, learn computer language. And we're going to be continuing doing that um, through the course of the year as well. We also, at the other end of the spectrum, in the youth room, had an early literacy center for the first time. We always have activity centers where the kids make things to take away. This year, we also had um, a place for children under the age of three with special multi-sensory experiences for them. We had purchased special toys and games. and. Um, the children use those with their caregivers. Staff also provided print materials to describe what developmental milestones each activity uh, was supposed to support. So it was all scientifically based. And all of the activity centers um, supported the science theme. Uh, So that, in a nutshell, is what we did, but I always save the best for the last, and that is to thank the friends of the library. Without uh, the friends, the summer reading just wouldn't even exist. Um, the summer reading, they support um, the funding for the programs, the prizes, the supplies, and this year we gave away over 500 paperback books to summer readers, youth and teen, the friends did all of that for us. All those books are plated, so those are all in everybody's home. They know where they came from. The friends provide a wonderful gift of reading and enrichment to the children, teens, and adults of Birmingham, Beverly Hills, Bingham Farms, and Bloomfield Hills, and we just couldn't do summer reading without them. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Connie. David, could I, could I say something? I think there's one thing I caught that Connie forgot. Uh, it's amazing that you, with all your programs, incredible, phenomenal staff, um, that you added the Early Literacy Center for toddlers this year, and all you did for up for teens. But I think you forgot to mention all the students that you engaged as Baldwin Boosters. I mean, most libraries, it's, it takes a lot of um, training, orientation, maybe hand-holding. Uh, 11 to 14-year-olds, is that what they are? And it takes for 500 a 500 hours uh, of community service right. in the youth room. And it takes a lot from staff to make sure that th each student is engaged and purposely, you know, helping out. So um, I, I just can't say enough. Our, our staff is stellar in the summer and all year round. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Connie. We, I always love hearing that report. You did talk about quite a few things. I have no idea what they are, like Minecraft and Raspberry Pi computers. <laughs> Maybe I'll learn that someday, not yeah. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, um, uh, Connie mentioned Raspberry Pi. Uh, Pi, in this case, is spelled P-I. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I did spell it wrong down here. <laughs> All right, now we are at the area of unfinished business. Yeah. We have to discuss the car calendar, I, I believe, Doug. Yes. Um, we brought a proposed calendar to you uh, two months ago, and there was discussion about that. Uh, at that time, we did not have the official City of Birmingham uh, calendar for 2015. The City Commission calendar is, has been approved and is uh, available on page 42 of the board packet. Um, ideally, uh, the library board does like to avoid uh, conflicts with the uh, city commission. However, uh, in some cases, they seem to be unavoidable. There are five conflicts uh, next year. Um, the library board 
by, according to its bylaws, meets on the third Monday of the month. There are three times next year when the city commission uh, has changed its regular schedule, so it will be meeting on the third Monday. There are two other Mondays when the um, planning board is holding a joint session with the city commission. Uh, so I am now proposing uh, to you the 2015 calendar. There is a motion on the agenda on page uh, three of the board packet. Does anybody want to change any of the dates? Do we, well, do we first do, there should uh, be a motion. Oh, I, I suggest a motion. A motion to approve the 2015 library calendar as found on page 41 of the September 2014 packet. I second. Support. Okay. okay. Where did that bob? Okay. okay. So, so um, is there any discussion? I would be in favor of retaining um, our regular meeting date, the third Monday of every month. Uh, because, uh, number one, so many of us who are on the board, as well as staff uh, and volunteers, plug this date into our calendars. Uh, we do have other um, obligations, family obligations, whether or it's booking travel or health appointments, etc., cetera, um, and our other commitments to other organizations and institutions. And so for many of us, uh, we plan far out. Um, I do know also um, we're pretty transparent. We're on cable. Um, our meetings are on the, the website. Um, we have a few faithful followers who like to go to both meetings, but um, they're few in number. Um, and I think we're looking at a greater number of staff and, and board members who have had this date kind of cast in stone. Um, we do accommodate and we go to city commission meetings and planning board when we can. We go to long range planning. Um, but uh, I would advocate that we um, keep our meeting dates the same. The third Monday of every month except on Martin Luther King Day when we'd move to Wednesday, January 21st. I think the greater good is served by Sheila's suggestion. I agree. I agree. All right. Are there any other discussion? Do we open it up to the public to this? Anybody? All right. Um, I, I mean, these unfortunately are unavoidable problems, and I think everyone has stated what they have to say. So I call for all in favor. Say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. That. I'll just add one thing, David. It also helps when we're recruiting our student representatives. Um, some of the busiest students that we know every year, we are lucky to get two students, and they plan ahead. And it's announced in December, uh, and it apply, it's applicable for the entire next year. So that's yes. one more reason. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Well, where am I here? Finished? Maybe. New and miscellaneous business. We don't. Nothing yeah, I, I do have new business. Just you know, I always like to thank our staff and recognize our staff for what they do and, and on their anniversary. So uh, John Hart reached 13 years of service on September 4th. Vicki Sauer reached seven years of service on September 5th. Amy Staples eight years of service on the 13th of September. Uh, Gloria Noble reached one year of service on September 16th. Elizabeth Volpe nine years of service on the 16th. Uh, Brandon Bolek Tabu Tabu uh, did I butcher that Tubo 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 13 years of service on September 18th Josh Ruan 14 years on the 19th Elizabeth Fennell reached 18 years of service on September 22nd and Roxanne Sander reached 12 years of service on September 30th thank you so much for your dedication and passion uh, to serve our residents and being part of the Baldwin uh, Public Library family thank you that's very impressive Information only. Could I just add one sure. date, upcoming date? We had to postpone our policy committee, so the public is invited. Our next policy committee meeting is October 1st at 5.30, and that will be upstairs in the boardroom. That's a Wednesday, I believe, correct? Okay, well then I think it's to me. Upcoming events of interest, all of them are important as opposed to last month when I didn't feel like I had anything important to say. I'm just going to reiterate, Tea at the Townsend with Madeline, October 18th, Saturday at 11 a.m. Um, also on Sunday, uh, Victoria Laurie, 
who is a very popular New York Times bestselling author who lives locally and is from Birmingham, um, is going to do a reading from her latest psychic eye mystery, Fatal Fortune. She has, uh, those are, uh, she has several adult series, she has a youth series, and she's coming out with a teen series next year. Um, she will also, and this is very exciting, she's a world-renowned psychic, and she will be taking questions from the audience for her psychic powers. So you can get, she said she has some, she has some, some guidelines and regulations as to what you can and cannot ask, but she doesn't do this for everyone, she's just doing it for us. So it's gonna be an exciting day. Um, also, the only other event I'm going to mention, even though they're all important, is that the annual tween lock-in and the Halloween lock-in for teens is coming up on um, October 10th. It's at 6.30 p.m. on a Friday, so it's after the library closes, and it's one of our most popular, most fun, slightly scary events <laughs> that we have at the library. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. <laughs> General public comment. Gone, gone, gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do you have anything that you want to say? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> um, do I have a motion for adjournment? I move to adjourn the Monday, September 18th meeting. Second. Second. All in favor? 15th. 15th. That's right. Sorry. Aye. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Official we're, we are adjourned, and now we will Proofreader. convene the uh, trust meeting. And we first of all must call the meeting to order and establish a quorum. Mr. Tara here. Mr. Suhey here. Mr. Pisano here. Ms. Bryce here. Mr. Underdown here. Absent of uh, Mr. Kellett here. Absent and excused is Mr. Harris and Ms. Malstrom. May I, um, do you feel that I need to read the consent agenda every time? Uh, yes. Yeah. Probably, it's good, yeah. It's the proper uh, um, protocol. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion and approved by a, a roll call vote. There will be no discussion of these items unless a board member or a citizen so requests, in which case, the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered as the last item under new business. Do I have a motion to move the consent agenda? I, I guess we need to do a roll call vote. Oh, yeah. We have to have a first and second. I, I, I second it. Okay, I missed that. So. Now a roll call vote. Mr. Tara? Yes. Mr. Suhey? Yes. Mr. Pisano? Yes. Ms. Bryce? Yes. Mr. Underdown? Yes. Absent and excused is Mr. Harris. Uh, so that, uh, that's passed. It's passed. So now we have uh, miscellane new and miscellaneous business. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, uh, you know, what I stated earlier in the, uh, from the Finance Committee meeting with Ron Carpenter, is doing a great job with managing uh, the endowment uh, assets. Uh, we're currently up five and a half percent. We are lagging um, our blended uh, benchmark by about two and three quarters percent, but over years past, I think with the modest changes he's making right now and uh, what we've seen in the past is that he closes that gap as the year comes by, you know, winds down. So I'm not worried about that. Uh, things are looking really good. I also want to just thank Mr. and Mrs. Gein. Um, they just finished their last contribution for their endowment funds last month. They're a young couple that have a young child, and it's very impressive of their dedication and passion for the Baldwin Public Library and, the, and what they did. So I want to thank them for their contribution, and I would hope uh, you know more individuals would follow their lead. Thank you, Frank. Does anyone else have any other comments on the board? Anybody from the public? Seeing none, may I have a motion for adjournment? I move to adjourn. Thank Support. you. Is it seconded? It is. Yes. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you very much.